Welcome back to our study called Two Camps. We're looking at Genesis 32, 1 through 23. And this is the uh, first main lesson of our study. And we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 2. And uh, I call this an angelic visitation because that's, that's what happens. So let's first look at how the angels of God come. And uh, Jacob, having finally left Laban, once and for all, right? He's gone. Laban is not coming back. Uh, Jacob finally goes on his way. He's doing what God told him to do. Rise up, go back to Canaan. That's what he's, he's doing. Now, on his way back to Canaan, he is met by the angels of God, it says. This is the second time that the angels of God have appeared to Jacob. Remember, the, the first time was when he was leaving Canaan. And now they are there to greet him as he returns. I think there's something special about that. According to Hebrews 1.14, the angels are called ministering spirits who are sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And so the angels minister to those who are being saved, which Jacob is one of those people being saved. And the angels are there to greet him on his return. We are told Jacob saw them, which is an unusual occurrence, right? Only certain people were allowed to to see the angels, and only on specific occasions. We're called to walk by faith and not by sight. We must practice great discernment when someone speaks of seeing angels in our day. There's something uh, kind of unsettling when people say, well, I saw the angels. You know, the angels only appeared to certain people. And for a very specific reason, God was doing something very special in uh, the plan of salvation that... He, sent, he allowed people to actually see the angels. of, uh, And so, you know, unless you're saying that what they're coming to do is, is going to change salvation um, or how the, the plan of salvation is going to play out, you know, I don't see why uh, I have a hard time believing when people say they've seen angels. Um, now, I don't have a problem with people saying I've seen demons because they do masquerade, as the Bible tells us, that even Satan himself will masquerade as an angel of light, masquerading, you know, and being seen by people. To me, that makes sense. I mean, how do you, <laughs> how do you pull people away from God? You know, you appear and like, hey, I'm an angel. Obey what I say. People are gullible enough to, to fall, fall into that. Now, Paul says, even if the angels of God would come and preach something different than what he preached, then, you know, may they be cursed. And so he's saying, you know what, even if an angel shows up and he's telling you some wacky stuff, don't believe him. <laughs> this is the gospel. This is the truth. There is no other truth. So that should give us a pause when people say, you know what, I saw an angel. And the angel told me that blah, 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 blah. You know, take, take a moment, like, okay, what's going on here? Because I read in the Bible that the angels only appeared visibly to very specific people for a very specific reason, and it had to do with, you know, most of the time it had to do with salvation or the fact that God was going to save them. Um, you know, when, God, when, when the people saw the, the armies of angels, it had to do with salvation or their personal saving, physically. Uh but other people, it's like, well, God has a message, and I saw this angel. I don't know about that. Um, you know, God spoke to us in many ways and and uh, at many times to the prophets, it says in the past. And that's what Hebrews tells us. But now he's spoken to us by his son. Uh, we don't need angels speaking to us. We don't need it. Now, could they? That's a good question. <laughs> but we don't need it. We don't. If I never see an angel in my whole life, I am not missing out. I think we can safely assume that that's the truth. All right, well, let's move on. Now, Jacob names the place where he sees the angels. And upon seeing these angels, Jacob declares, this is God's camp. And so he names, it, names the place Mahanaim, which means two camps. Now, the exact location of Mahanaim has been lost to uh, history, but the biblical record by the from the biblical record, we know it was located on the east side of the Jordan, somewhere near the Jabbok River, because that's where he was. He had him across the fords of the river, and so 
it's somewhere over there. Now, um, Ahaniah would play an important role in the life of another biblical character, King David. King David fled to Mahanaim when his son Absalom marched into Jerusalem and stole the throne. That's where he went. He went to this place where the angels met Jacob. So David would be there when the news of his death reached him too. So he was there that whole time, finds out that Absalom was murdered or was killed in, in battle, uh, and, he, and he wept. That's where he was at that city. Now, Mahanaim is a as a reoccurring theme, and it appears a few times in this part of the story, the idea of two camps. Uh, this is the first mention of multiple camps. In verse 7, Jacob will divide all he has, and he divides it into two camps. In 33, 7, Jacob divides his family into four, each wife with the children she bore, and Shet, which is, you know, two, 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 two camps. <laughs> he has two, two camps. In, uh, in chapter 33, we find Jacob's camp uh, meeting Esau's camp. So again, you have Jacob's camp, and then you have Esau's camp, two camps. So there's this undercurrent of division, of dividing, uh, more than one camp, more than one, um, you know, direction, more than one agenda, because each person, each group has their own specific reason why they're there. And uh, so you have these different camps. So you see, the, the fact that uh, Jacob named the place means that what happened there was to be remembered, too. Remember, they don't just go around naming places just for the sheer fun of it. There's a reason why you would name a place and why that n place name was maintained throughout history. So just like the naming of Beersheba and Bethel, Mahanaim was to stand as a memorial to this event. People said the name, they would connect it to the story in their mind, and like, oh yeah, this is where... You know, Jacob saw the angels, you know, so it wasn't just, I don't think David just flew, fled there because, I mean, it might have been a location. It's on the other side of the Jordan, so he's leaving Israel. He's leaving Canaan. Um, but yeah, you know, sometimes you wonder why did these people go to these places? Well, I mean, would you take comfort in a place where angels appeared to your forefathers many, many years ago? I think you would. I mean, there was there's something special about that. You remember, okay, I'm in this place where God sent his angels uh, to meet Jacob. That would help if I'm on my uh, if I'm on the run. So now, uh, you know, we're people who quickly forget what God has done in our lives, and the Scripture is full of those that saw the mighty hand of God but then quickly forget and turn their back on Him. Now, may we learn to mark out our own Bethels. May we have our own Mahanaims in our own lives. And not forget the work of God in our lives. We need to remember certain times in God, in our lives, when God is, has acted where He has, uh, you know, where we clearly saw the providence, the care of God in our lives. We should mark those events to not forget. Because oftentimes when we get into trials, you know, we forget what God has done in the past. And we don't need, we don't want to do that. And I think the naming of these places helped because you could pass that on to generations. You know, you could pass that on to the next generation, to your kids and say, hey, you know, when we were at this place, you know, that was a, a hard time. And, but God brought us through it and God helped us through that. Um, we have a place like that in, in our, in our own history in my family's history that wouldn't have passed on. And then, you know, maybe our, our kids will share that with our grandkids. And maybe I'll share it with our grandkids. And uh, maybe it'll keep being passed on. Like it was at this place that our family went through this and God helped them through that and God blessed them on the other side of that. So keep those things in the family. Remind your family, this is, you know, look what God has done. And uh, remember what God has done. People were always condemned in the Bible because they forgot what they did, what God had done for them. And uh, I mean, read the book of Judges over and over again. They forgot. The wilderness wanderings were mainly because they forgot what God had done. Not that they forgot mentally, but they chose not to honor God for what he's done. So, all right, next time we'll uh, take a look at the next couple of verses, three through eight, and uh, look at what Jacob does after meeting the angels and before he decides to go into the land of Canaan. So come back next time and we'll take a look at that.